Some of our listeners may be aware of a book that's getting some critical acclaim in apologist circles. The name of the book is Is God a Moral Monster? Making Sense of the Old Testament by Paul Copen. It's getting the praise of a lot of apologists such as William Lane Craig, Richard Swinburne. Well, then it must be good. And it will be the subject of today's counter-apologetics segment. Hide your faith from the light of reason. It's now time for counter-apologetics. Paul Copen in his book, Is God a Moral Monster?, is basically trying to argue that, no, God is not a moral monster. It's basically a whitewash of the Hebrew Bible and all the atrocities that we read within it. It covers a lot of ground. Mm -hmm. So for the counter-apologetics today, we are just going to be focusing on Paul Copen's arguments defending the character of God in the face of the extermination of the Canaanites that we read about in Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and other books of the Hebrew Bible. It's quite a lengthy genocide. Is this when the Israelites were moving into the, back from, supposedly back from Egypt and moving into the land of Canaan and milk and honey? Yes, it is. And actually, that brings up some important points for context, is that uh, part of the military campaign of the Israelites as they go into the promised land is to extinguish the Canaanites from the land. That does not mean they conducted themselves uh, the same way in all of their military campaigns. Uh, that could be a potential source for confusion in this particular debate. There were two different policies. One policy was for military campaigns outside of the border borders of the promised land, and the other policy was for holy war within the borders of the promised land. Within the borders of the promised land, the policy is harem, mm -hmm. the Hebrew word harem. Oftentimes it is translated devote to destruction. It's actually a ritual act. It's very akin to sacrifice. Everything that breathes, uh, men, women, children, even livestock are killed. And also all of the material spoils of war are likewise destroyed. It, it, and because it's in the promised land, it's a, a little like... Um, if you were defending your own house, if someone broke into your house, you could shoot them and it would be OK because they're trespassing their their your uh, home. You know, the problem with that analogy is that they're moving into somebody else's house. Well, exactly. <laughs> but I think it, I think it's their problem with, uh, with, with that. But there is definitely an aspect of, yes, we are not making any kind of think compromise. Like yeah. You, you move into Mexico, take the territory. Right, then right. you have these laws where you can shoot on site. But they believe it's their home. They believe it's yes. God's It is the land that has been is promised to them and therefore or they have uh, every right to. Weirdly enough, the Canaanite gods also promised it to the Canaanites. So Yeah, that's the problem with divine land contract deals. <laughs> but here, real quick, uh, there's a passage in Deuteronomy which explains briefly both policies. Hmm. So before we go any further, let me read this. This is Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 18. Uh, this is the first one is the policy for people outside of the borders of Canaan. Hmm. When you draw near to a town to fight against it, offer it terms of peace. If it accepts your terms of peace and surrenders to you, then all the people in it shall serve you in forced labor. If it does not submit to you that's peacefully. That's the good option. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. yes, that's the, the good option is forced labor. Slavery. And, enslavement. Okay. Uh, it, if it does not submit to you peacefully but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when Yahweh, your God, gives it into your hand, you shall put all of its males to the sword. You may, however... Does that mean circumcise or kill? Uh, that means kill. Oh, okay. Just Circum clarifying. Circumcise first, then kill. <laughs> You may, however, take as your booty the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the town. All is spoil. You may enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which Yahweh has given to you. Thus, you shall treat all the towns that are very far from you, which are not towns of the nation here. Here's the switch. But as for the towns of these people that Yahweh your God is giving you as your inheritance, you must not let anything that breathes remain alive. You shall annihilate them. 
the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, just as Yahweh your God has commanded, so that they may not teach you to do all the abhorrent things that they do for their gods, and you thus sin against Yahweh your God. So I, I think it's pretty unequivocal what is being asked of the people here. Yeah, yeah. Wipe them out so that they can't possibly um, affect your culture in any right. way, shape, or form. Kill them all. Uh, yeah, annihilate is is pretty clear. It's a strong uh, word. Mm-hmm. And uh, in case there was any doubt about it, here's a quick sample of it actually taking place. Uh, we have several instances of this, but Joshua uh, 6, 17 through 20 is a great example. It's, it's the story of Jericho. Um, the city and all that is in it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. That is that word harem again. Hmm. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are in her house shall live because she hid the messengers we sent. Uh, if you know the story of Jericho, they send in spies and Rahab actually gives them safe shelter in her tavern. And so as payback, they're uh, sparing her from the slaughter. As for you, keep away from the things devoted to destruction so as not to covet or take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel an object of destruction or bring trouble upon it. I read that verse because it's important to know that this was enforced by God if people broke Haram, that is, if they went any less if than destroying any everything. Or kept people alive, anything. God would curse them and oftentimes punish them with death. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown, and as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, they raised a great shout and the wall fell down. So the people charged straight ahead into the city and captured it, and they devoted to destruction, harem, by the edge of the sword of the city, both men, women, young, old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys. So complete slaughter. That's just wasteful. Yeah, it is. They do. They keep the trees. I know I point this out every time Harem comes up on the podcast, but I, I just I find it cute that they're like, but don't cut down the trees. <laughs> that would be wrong. That'd be going too far. Jericho is the first Arbor Day city, apparently. In the... We don't have anything against their orchards. Just the livestock. So uh, Paul Copen's task then is to convince us <laughs> over the course of three chapters that those verses don't actually mean what they say. His book just strings a, a series of claims. So there's there's no way that I can address point by point every single argument that he makes. Right. But I, I actually I want to I want to give my public approval and thanks to uh, Tom Stark, who actually has taken the time to refute point by point absolutely everything Copen says. Um, it's a free PDF that you can get online. It's called Is God a Moral Compromiser? And it's a review of Copen's book that's actually longer, significantly <laughs> longer than Copen's book. In fact, he, he really goes overboard sometimes. He will spend, you know, five or six pages just blowing to pieces even really trivial or minor points uh, made by Copen. Wow. So, a lot of what I'm going to say in this segment is going to be really just taken by Tom Stark. I will try to uh, make sure that I'm pointing that out every time I do it. Uh, but he's really done a great service for all all of us so that we don't have to now. Check out our website, doubtcast.org, and we'll have a link to uh, Stark's PDF. And make sure you, uh, make sure you uh, support him in any way you can. And as he's not going to be getting a lot of financial kickback for all that work that he's put into it. So Copen's argument, uh, the arguments I want to address are these. Number one, Copen argues that God gave the Canaanites a chance to repent and avoid destruction. He claims that God will only annihilate people as a last resort. I, I know. That, even even that, the... that feels much better, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. what a softy. You know, I'm glad we can joke about um, people trying to whitewash genocide. Yeah, well. A second point, that the slaughter of the Canaanites was actually morally justified as their moral and spiritual depravity reached a threshold where they were beyond redemption. Number three, that the conquest of the Holy Land is not actually a case of genocide or ethnic cleansing. 
In fact, the Bible deliberately exaggerates the level of the killing that actually took place. Uh, Number four, that for the most part, the Israelites were not killing women, children, and babies, but combatants only. And number five, that even if he did kill women, children, and babies, the women deserved it, and the babies and children would have gone to heaven anyways, so it's all okay. (laughs) 